Soil supports all terrestrial life on our planet. You might not think about soil often, but it is the source of most of our food. The health of our soil and understanding how it functions in relationship to the plants and microbes in its environment is critical to me, to you, and to everyone on Earth. Soils can also benefit the climate. As we continue to use fossil fuels to make electricity, heat our homes and buildings, and power our travel, we've been increasing the amount of heat-trapping greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. This results in more variable and extreme weather. While the scale of climate change is massive, we have many solutions that can help us reverse track. Soil might play a key role. Soil can counteract the carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels by absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it deep in the ground. It is estimated that soils store three times as much carbon as all the plants on Earth. Some soils can store more carbon than others. Increasing soil carbon, or how much carbon is stored in soil, is a win-win solution. We can get more productive soils for agriculture and decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that causes climate change. We now know that carbon in the soil is really good, but how does it actually get there? Most of it comes from plants. Plants undergo a process called photosynthesis, where they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to build their shoots and roots. The more carbon plants put underground or into the soil, the better. We can grow plants that both store carbon in the soil and can be used to produce fuel for boats and planes that are currently powered with fossil fuels. The Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center studies how certain plants can be grown and harvested to produce sustainable, renewable fuel that is good for the climate and for the land where the plants are grown. The above ground part of the plant is used to make fuel, while the plant's roots grow deep into the ground and build soil carbon. Uh, soil can achieve an increase in the soil carbon storage when the amount of the carbon added to the soil exceeds the amount that is being decomposed and returned to the atmosphere as a carbon dioxide. Therefore, there are two fundamental ways to achieve soil carbon gains by adding more new carbon into the soil or by maximizing stabilization and the protection of the soil carbon, both uh, the newly incorporated one and that already present in the soil. Some crops, especially perennial grasses like switchgrass, poplar trees, and mixed native grasses are especially good at building soil carbon for reasons that we don't fully understand. Partly it's because we don't till the soil every year when we plant these perennial crops. And when we till the soil, we tend to stimulate the microbes that then produce CO2 from stored carbon. And partly it's because the roots are in the soil year round instead of just for a few weeks, as is the case for annual crops. Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center scientists want to determine how to increase the amount of soil carbon in the ground. Different bioenergy crops have the different carbon storage capability. We were thinking, why is that? Who makes this difference? So my research questions came from here. So we can use the two contrasting bioenergy uh, crop fields, one with only one species, switchgrass. Another one is uh, restored prairie with 18 different plant species, including the switchgrass. So we are going to uh, look a little closer into this field and it can be triers to see each plant and soil under the plant. If plants can interact underground, that makes us wonder. Could neighboring plants' interactions impact soil carbon? Above ground, we see diverse plantings of different plant species, but we're just now getting the techniques to be able to study this below ground. And one thing that I've learned is that depending on who a plant neighbors, it interacts with different microbes. And one of the ways it does this is by the carbon that it puts underground. So plant roots secrete carbon-rich sugar substrates called root exudates. And these root exudates are really critical for plants' ability to communicate with both these different plant neighbors and with the microbes that it's interacting with. A previous study I've done showed that the composition of these root exudates, so maybe 
the different sugars that are the different acids that a plant is putting out through its roots changes depending on who these neighbors are. And so if those root exudates change depending on who a neighbor is, there's a high chance that that's also affecting the amount of carbon below ground. Roots and the exudates they leak impact the soil's carbon storage because the carbon is passing directly from the air, through the plants, and into the soil. Another pathway for carbon to get from the atmosphere through the plants and into the soil is through fungi. Plants indirectly exchange carbon from one neighbor to another through fungal hyphae that connect them underground. Plants evolve with fungi as helpers, as friends. And so there's many groups of fungi that depend on plants and plants depend on them for proper nutrition. These are called mycorrhizal fungi and they are kind of an extension of the plant root system. So they help the plants obtain water, they help the plants obtain phosphorus, and they also help absorb nitrogen and transfer this to the plants. And so we think about them as biofertilizers. Their filaments are like one one hundredth the diameter of my hair. So they're very, very small. And this allows them to transgress across and within soil pores. And so they're able to mine out nutrients where plant roots would not have access to them. Once carbon is in the soils, it's stored in soil pores. The structure of the pores impacts carbon storage. Basically, soil pore functions as a channel of the air, water and the nutrient in the soil environment, but they also can be the habitat for the microorganism in the soil, which use the soil carbon as their energy source. That carbon which leave microbes body as a non-gaseous form. That would be the carbon that can be most effectively protected from the further decomposition. Such carbon compounds can be easily tied to the surface of the soil, uh, like clay particles, or they can also move into the very small soil pores. And in there, carbon can be protected for a long time, like uh, hundreds or even thousands of years. Carbon storage in soils also depends on tiny soil microorganisms like bacteria. They use carbon as their energy source. While some of the carbon will be lost to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, a part of it will stay remaining in the soil. In one teaspoon of soil, you'll have billions of bacterial cells. So they are like many, many of these tiny uh, microbes in the soil. What bacteria does is it uses the complex organic compounds that are available from the plant roots in the form of like root exudates or the rhizodeposits, those kind of stuff. So it takes those uh, complex organic compounds and break down them into simpler form uh, and uses them as an energy sources. And the simpler form is then gives it back to the plant. So it's like an exchange trade between the microbe and the plant where they help each other. To break down carbon in soils, microbes need enzymes. Microbes are very small and they can't eat their carbon foods and digest them inside of their body um, because these carbon molecules are too big for them. So they secrete these enzymes to the soil and let these carbon compounds cut into smaller pieces in the soil around them and then absorb those cut down pieces. Um, this is why the enzymes we find in the soil are called extracellular enzymes. If you want to see how active the soil microbes are, looking at the extracellular enzyme activity is a good choice um, because it tells us how hard they're trying to eat their foods and what kind of food they're targeting to eat. And most importantly, how much carbon they can potentially eat. As you can see, there are lots of different things that might influence how soil carbon accumulates. We designed an experiment to get to the nitty gritty of how plant interactions, root exudates, Fungi and bacteria. Soil pores. Enzymes. All impact carbon storage in soils. How do we address all these research questions and see the roots without disturbing the plants while they're growing? So we, we started designing the rise of boxes uh, late uh, 2019. Uh, we went through a couple uh, iterations before we settled on this like three compartment design. We actually had to build all these from the ground up. So we purchased like a ton of plastic and just used a bunch of cement, a lot of bolts and screws and, and assembled these. And they're like uh, half a meter 
uh, long and like a third of a meter high. So they're quite big. Each box needed like a few kilos of soil to fill them. What we had to do is we, we wanted to pack them to a certain bulk density uh, and a certain moisture level. And just because of how, how they're set up, of how thin and, and tall they are, it, we couldn't bring them to the certain moisture level without adding the moisture as we were filling. Uh, it took us like seven days and we had like 14 different people come through and each everybody was packing boxes, uh, just in layers, adding water, put another layer of soil. And after, after we reached the top, then we compressed them all, put the bolts on and moved to the next box. The Rhizo boxes will help us cross multiple scales to understand how tiny things like soil pores and microbes ultimately can have huge impacts on plant communities and global carbon storage. How can we tell what carbon came into the soil from plants? And how can we tell from which plant the carbon came? You can uh, track the carbon by using isotopic elements. So we use 13C. It's a stable isotope. You find it in nature naturally. So our boxes have three plants. We make it so the plants, we don't want to uptake this 13C. Uh, we cover them. So then they're not photosynthesizing. Think about it just like going to bed, right? You're not going to be eating. You're not going to be walking around the house. And that's exactly what these plants are doing when they're covered. They're just kind of, they're waiting to get some sunlight so they can become active again, you know? So the plant that we allow to take up that 13 seed takes it up through its leaves and then it distributes it all across the plant and wherever it's growing. It also uses it in exudates on the roots. And then these microbes live on these roots and they'll eat up those exudates and they'll, they'll reproduce and they'll, they'll grow these communities. And then when you have like roots that interact with each other, these different neighbors, then you can get the communities that kind of like live on, on both roots, they kind of transfer the carbon that way. So it's really interesting that you can start to see your 13 C carbon in plants that you didn't allow to uptake it through the air. It's actually transferred through the roots. So we grew these plants at an angle and that allowed the roots to grow on the surface of this rhizobox. And when doing that, we could visualize where the roots were. So we carefully used sterilized tweezers and little spatulas to dig the root, almost like an archaeologist. We were excavating these roots out of the soil to carefully collect them. So after excavating this root, we put them in a plastic tube and we fill the plastic tube with glass beads. And the role of this glass beads is to stimulate a soil environment where the root is interacting with different pores and different sizes of soil particles, but it's glass and so it's sterile. And that allows us to extract all of these carbon rich compounds or root exudates that they're pushing out. After eight months of preparation is over, the most exciting and important part, sampling the plants and soil begins. For my study, I specialize in looking at the microbes in their habitat. That is like how they're located in the environment they're living. So I look at microbes living in soil, on the soil matrix or on the plant roots. What we do is like we take like a gram of soil and then there are different methods. There are like general stains that can be used where you can stain the cell wall of a bacteria and look at, uh, you can quantify them. Or there are some advanced techniques such as FISH, which is fluorescent in situ hybridization. So it's like a probe which goes and binds to the RNA of the microbe, which has, it's like a small sequence of the complementary RNA, you know? So if you know that small sequence, you can like add an additional dye of your choice. So when it goes and binds to the RNA, it fluoresces, like it glows. And then you can visualize it under the microscope so that we can use it on in undisturbed soil samples. And the good thing is like we can use different type of dyes. So just imagine like a blank canvas and you have like all different type of bacteria. And for each particular bacterial group, you have different kind of dyes. So it will be a wonderful, colorful uh, picture with all different type of bacteria showing like how they live. And bacteria is usually in form of small colonies. But with this technique, with this fish technique, we can see individual cells, how they are like grouped into and where they are situated in their habitat. First, I take small rhizoboxes from our rhizoboxes and I will map the soil enzyme activities on the soil surface. But since, since these enzymes are just liquid in the soil, we can't see them. So we can use these artificial carbon compounds that becomes fluorescent when they are cut by these enzymes. I will attach a membrane soaked with this carbon compound and put it on the soil surface. Then the enzymes in the soil will react with the compounds and become fluorescent. In this way, we can map the enzyme activity by capturing this 
fluorescence. And then these fluorescence are only visible when they are with these ultraviolet lights. Once we have that, just normal DSLR cameras can capture those fluorescences. There are many ways to analyze this. Um, for example, if we want to uh, find the hotspots, which means like very high activity area, we just like set the threshold values and then only select the soil area where the enzyme activities are like above certain value. Also, we can separate out the root areas and then just look at the enzyme activity on those roots. The researchers are currently analyzing results that will then be written up and published. However, the work curiosity and questioning won't stop there. So if, if these root exudates and if these different plant neighbor interactions are in fact changing these soil microbial communities, does that have effect on future plant growth or does that affect how these plants are interacting? So in one year, switchgrass might be growing with certain neighbors and the next year, maybe a different neighbor comes in and do the microbes that it grew with in the first year affect how it interacts with that plant in the second year. This is something that's really hard to study in the field because you can't control who those neighbors are or who's in the soil, but these plant soil feedback experiments allow us to more easily get at these questions. With more data analysis and experiments on the way, our researchers are working to better understand how interactions with the community of plants and microbes around bioenergy crops can help them store even more carbon in the soil. As we learn more about the potential to grow plants for fuel, we can work with farmers to grow crops that take up more carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the soil for longer periods of time. The ongoing collaborative research at the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center is just one of the ways in which we can all work together to protect our soils and to reduce the threats of climate change. To learn more about our work and to get involved, visit glbrc.org. <laughs>